All right, so we're seeing some people are starting to enter. Um, and while everyone is coming in, getting situated, getting comfortable, just want to say a big hearty welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for joining us today for this incredible poetry event, uh, which is a collaboration between the 32nd annual San Diego International Jewish Film Festival, the Yiddish Book Center, Yiddish Arts and Academics Association of North America, or YANA, and Yiddish Land, California. We are so grateful to be joined by all of you, including our incredible guests for today's event. And I am so thankful for this collaboration and what it has has given us as far as this, this really significant film um, by Krista and Emily, as well as this wonderful event. So uh, without further ado, uh, I don't want to take up any more time with my talking because there's so much other wonderful talking happening today. I am going to send it over to Krista, uh, who is going to get us started today. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Lauren, and thanks to the San Diego International Jewish Film Festival. It's just been so wonderful to be at the festival, even though we weren't able to be there in person, um, to be able to celebrate our US West Coast premiere with you all. Um, it's just been absolutely a wonderful experience. So Sholem Aleichem. Um, welcome everyone. Um, Eches Krista Whitney. Um, I'm Krista Whitney. I'm, as Lauren said, the director and co-director and co-producer of Vervet Belaibu, who will remain, um, and also the director of the Yiddish Book Center's Wexler Oral History Project. Um, and it's just a real delight to, to invite you all to this uh, event celebrating the Yiddish poetry of Avram Sutzkever. Um, it's an exciting uh, event for me personally because it was it was thanks to uh, Avram Sutzkever's poetry that I really um, came into this world of Yiddish poetry. Um, well, first of all, um, I, I, I want to give uh, Sutzkever kind of the first word of this event. Um, so I'm going to start by showing a short clip from our film that features Sutzkever's voice. You'll, you'll hear one stanza of the title poem from our film, Verbet Bleiben, and some of his reflections from a, an, an event that happened at the Montreal Jewish Public Library. Um, so here he is. Verbet Bleiben, Busfet Bleiben. Bleib me wet a traf. Breish is de carois so grosen wider den bashaf. Bleib me wet a fiddleroys de covet sich allein. Sieben grosen von die grosen wellen sie verstehen. Ich will sie der Leuben zu bringen etliche eigene Gedanken und Aphorismen wegen Dichtung. Dichtung befreit den Menschen von innerlicher Versklavung. Der Fahr ist leichter zu gehen zum Tod mit der Lied. Poesie heißt, befreien sich von der Emotions und auch viele befreien sich von der Persönlichkeit. Aber befreien sich durch Dichtung von der Persönlichkeit well, I, I would like to now um, introduce the panelists. Um, we do have a last minute change. Unfortunately, Dr. Miriam Trin is unable to join us because of a family emergency, but we, uh, we are very grateful to Dr. Justin Cami um, for, for joining us. So I'll introduce each person and maybe you can just un, you can turn your video on and, and wave and then, and then I'll, um, we'll get started. So first of all, we have Justin Cami, who is a professor of Jewish studies and world literatures at Smith College. 
He is a leading expert on the interwar Yiddish literary group Jung Vilna. Kami penned the introduction to a recent translation of Sitzgeber's poetry, Richard Fine's The Full Pomegranate, and most recently translated and edited Avram Sitzgeber's From the Vilna Ghetto to Nuremberg, um, which is, was published by McGill Queen's University Press 2021, um, and was a finalist for the 2021 National Jewish Book Award. Um, so, hi, Justin. Thank you so much for, for coming. Thank you. Um, and now I'm uh, going to introduce Emily Felder, who is the editor and co-director of Vervet Bleiben, who will remain. She is a documentary film editor whose work has been screened in museums, libraries, and schools across the country. Emily studied anthropology at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, where she became invested in archaeology, visual ethnography, and nonfiction storytelling. She worked as the premier technical assistant at the Yiddish Book Center's Wexler Oral History Project and as an assistant editor at Florentine Films Hot Productions feature on feature length documentaries broadcast on PBS. She is now based in Los Angeles, where she continues to make films. Welcome, Emily. Hello, thank you. So excited to be here. And next we have Hadas Calderon, who is the granddaughter of renowned uh, poet Avram Sutskever and an actress, theater maker, playwright, and director who is currently serving as the artistic direct director of the National Youth Theater in Israel. Adas is the producer um, and creative mind behind Vervet Bleiben, who will remain, and an associate producer as well of the award-winning documentary Black Honey, The Life and Poetry of Avram Sitzkever. Shalom, Hadas. Welcome. Shalom to everybody from Tel Aviv. And next we have Sasha Hoffman. Sasha received a PhD in comparative literature at the University of Michigan in 2012 with a dissertation focused on humorous representations of oppression within the writing of four classical Yiddish and Harlem Renaissance writers, Langston Hughes, Zora Neale Hurston, Sholem Aleichem, and Marcus Spector. Among other things, Sasha is a student and a teacher of Yiddish language and culture with a particular interest in leftist and women's writing. Hi, Sasha. Shalom Aleichem. And last but certainly not least, we have Jana, who is a doctoral candidate in Yiddish language and culture at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, and CEO and founder of the Yiddish Arts and Academics Association of North America and Yiddish Lang California. Shalom Aleichem, Ale. Good to see you. Hi, thank you for having me. And thanks, Jana, for, for really helping to organize the event today. Um, all right, so now that the whole team is on camera here, <laughs> I'm going to pass things over to Justin, who's going to give us a bit of context uh, uh, for Sitzgeber. Well, thank you, uh, Krista, and thank you to the San Diego Jewish Film Festival, and especially thank you to Jana, whose uh, growth I've been following with great excitement. Uh, Krista texted me uh, about 9 30, 10 o'clock, this morning to ask if I would be around today and asked me to give about 10 minutes of context about Sutzkever. So I'm looking at the names of some of the participants, some of whom are very distinguished colleagues who uh, certainly could uh, provide some of this context themselves. But um, I will uh, do my best to provide an overview for those uh, who've watched the film or who are about to watch the film and uh, then uh, turn things over uh, to listen to Sutzkover readings and have something of a discussion, and of course, to listen to Hadas uh, Calderon. Uh, I begin with a, a quotation from Sutzkover's poem to the thin vein on my head that he wrote in 1945. Quote, I love the unadulterated taste of a word that won't betray itself, not some sweet and sour hybrid with a strange taste. Whether I rise on the rungs of my ribs or fall, that word is mine. A tongue burns in the black pupil of my eye, no matter how great my generation might be, and greater yet is its smallness. Still eternal is the word in all of its ugliness and splendor. I think it's quite remarkable to think that a poet could write this in 1945, to write about 
the unadulterated taste of a word that won't betray itself, to still have faith in language, to still have faith in readers, to still have faith in humanity. And what I wanted to do today was provide something of an overview for, about what does it mean to emerge from a world that is so culturally substantive into a universe that is so morally perverse and then to rebuild again. Or if we wanna frame it in terms of Sutzkober's own life, what is the connection between his youth, a period I've elsewhere called when Yiddish was young, his period in the ghetto and in the partisans and perhaps even in Moscow, the literature of destruction, and then the period that really defined most of his career, that is the literature of renewal. In the early summer of 1930, 17-year-old Avram Sutzkover stood on Buffalo Mountain overlooking the city of Vilna. He was dressed uh, in a scout's uniform consisting of a gray shirt with two pockets in front and a pen knife was attached to his belt. He carried a walking stick and a rucksack. And opposite him, if you can imagine this, dressed in identical attire, was none other than Dr. Max Weinreich, director of the Yiddish Scientific Institute and head of the BIN, the B, the local Yiddishist scouting organization that Weinreich himself uh, had founded. He administered an oath of induction to the young Sutzkever, in which this tall, thin, blue-eyed, bespectacled, bespectacled young man uh, eagerly repeated in Yiddish, I swear to serve Yiddish culture. I swear to help those around me. Uh, this is quite remarkable that uh, for the next uh, number of decades, all the way up until the period of his death, um, Sutzkever maintained his oath, an oath that he swore on Buffalo Mountain in Vilna. The interwar period saw the emergence in Poland of uh, the Landkantenisch movement, this Jewish society for the exploration of the countryside. And that's why Sutzkever was there swearing this oath to Yiddish, Yiddish culture. He wanted to reconnect with the landscape, not only the urban landscape of his hometown, but also to affirm the Jews' stake in Eastern Europe as part of their own cultural inheritance. And he published his first poem in the Bean Hiking Songbook, a, a song that he composed to the tune of a Polish march at their winter camp in 1931. Hey, hey, brave Bienen, unser Weg ist unser Himmel, unser Lied ist unser Willen, ständig singen, ständig spielen. Of course, those of us who have been reading Sutzkever for years know that he later applied, a few years later, for membership in the interwar Yiddish uh, literary group Jung Vilna, Young Vilna, a local coterie of poets and writers and artists. And though the sole criterion for membership was aesthetic promise, the social orientation of the group was leftist. And its leaders determined uh, at his initial application that the um, literature ought to serve the cause of the Jewish street. And Sutzkever's poetry seemed to serve the cause of Jewish art. So his own statement, perhaps of poetic arrival, uh, that shunned political involvement and that shunned his own initial rejection begins with one of these most astonishing poems of youth. Ot bin ich doch an euch gebliter in mein ganzer Grace, verstochen mit Gesangen wie mit feierdicke Bienen. Here I am, blooming as big as I am, stung with songs as with fiery bees. He constructs a Yiddish hineni, right? Ot bin ich doch, here I am upon the echoes of earlier texts. However, in this quest for contact with the ultimate truth, his addressee, his ich, is, a transcendent, is seeking a transcendent spiritual truth at the heart of existence. It's not God, but the muse itself. He would go on to then write poems. Uh, his most famous early uh, cycle of poems was Sibir, Siberia, about his childhood in Siberia. But I think most um, unmentioned, but perhaps most important to me in my development as a scholar of Sutzkever is this idea that he wrote about in 1935 in the Jung Vilna Journal, where he writes uh, in a poem called Beim Schwell von Atog, at the outset of the day, the sun is my flag and words are my anchor. I can't see anything um, greater a poetic statement of what Sutzkever stands for, then the rejection of the politicization of the moment. What is my flag? The sun and words are my anchor. 
And as late as spring 1939, he embraced this self-image as the Ariel of Yiddish poetry by warning against the corrosive effects of despair. Do not love gray time, he writes in one of his poems. And later on in Valdix, 1940, a collection of poems that he had written between 1937 and 1939, he transforms Yiddish into this private liturgical language when parts of Poland are already under Nazi occupation. He could have written something despairing. He could have written something dark. What does he publish in 1940? Everything is precious for my verse. And in everything, I come upon a splinter of uh, infinity. Of course, we'll talk a little bit later today in the film that many of you have watched or will watch about Sutzkever's uh, incredible, uh, uh, incredible importance for what would become Hurban Literatur, or the literature of destruction. Uh, it's important that he believes so much in the transcendent power of poetry in his formative years before the war, because it allowed it to avoid being consumed as a poet during the war. So if the war crushed the faith of those who had always engaged in politics in their writing, since he had never put faith in humanity uh, in a political uh, vein prior to the war, but rather in art, where others were destroyed, poetry sustained him. So for instance, in the first weeks of the Nazi occupation, when roundups of local Jews were constant and young men were disappearing off the streets by the hundreds, Sutzkever hides in a chimney and then in between the floorboards of his mother's attic, he pokes a tiny hole through the wood, permitting a single beam of light to penetrate. And there writes, here, where I conceal myself between God and the devil, I pierce the tin roof with a nail, and behold, a ray of light, a heavenly shining needle, with whose aid I needle letters on the silvery parchment of my flesh forever and forever. Once beyond the borders of Vilna several years later, momentarily safe from the forces of liquidation, but still hunted by Poles and Lithuanians, he composes an amazing poem called Farewell as an address to his hometown with a pledge and with a promise. You are my first love and that you will always remain. I carry your name through the world as my distant grandfather bore through the desert the flame of the ark on his shoulders. And anywhere I wander, all the cities will transform into your image. I will not strike root in any other soil. However, we know that as much as Sutzkever accomplished during his Jung Vilna period, as much as Sutzkever's name will be remembered for writing what is perhaps the most important Yiddish, and I might even add Jewish poetry of the period of the Holocaust, the vast majority of his career was not in Poland, but in Eretz Yisrael, right? In the land of Israel. And he writes very soon after his arrival, I, one who saw the destruction of my people, felt that we, the small remnant of Yiddish writers, could with the power of our pen put in no claim for the blood of Vilna. But we could, and we must put in a claim for the burning of our language on the bonfires by giving it rebirth in the land of our ascent. This is an amazing statement that we must put in our claim for the destruction of our language by giving it rebirth in the land of our ascent. Going on later to suggest we as Yiddish writers must not assimilate into Israel, we must assimilate Israel into ourselves. If the destruction was sung about in Yiddish, so too must the revival. So I think that's enough to know uh, about the extraordinary nature of this poet in about 10 minutes. And uh, I wanna turn it over to others and encourage all of you to uh, watch this movie if you haven't already. Thank you for the invitation. And I hope that next time you'll have the opportunity to hear my colleague, uh, Dr. Miriam Trin. Thanks so much, Justin. Uh, it takes me back to the beginning of my story with Yiddish. Whenever I hear you present like that, your lectures so inspirational. So thank you. And thank you again for hopping on at the last minute. Maybe you can hang around if there are questions 
Um, I'm sure people have lots of questions <laughs> based on that. Um, well, now we'd like to really get to the, the heart of the program um, of really of reading some of Sutzkever's poems. Um, we are bringing Miriam's, um, you know, geist, her spirit into the space by, by we are going to read the four poems that she had chosen. Um, and we're going to have Sasha read the Yiddish, um, and we're going to take turns reading the English, and then even one of them, we're going to hear Hadas reading the Hebrew translation. So I um, will put them up on the screen, and um, Sasha, once they're up there, you can you can jump in. Zum Daten. Date, noch ein Schlitten mit deinen Ohren, noch gelaufen bin ich dir, knei unzu joggen ergens dein Sikoren, mit der teuben Busem weiß wie Schnee. Wenn es heute Chuter dir an einem, ausgehackt, a hart zklappet Kerl, Lohn, und verschlungen hat dich bald der Ton, wo du finkelst unter Eis ad Heil, hab ich dort reinfallen gewollt. No, mein Teub ist dämmelt grad verfleugen, oven sund bekränt mit weißem Gold und er ruft zum Leben mich gezeugen. The English translation to my father. Father, I pursued the sledge that bore your coffin, running after you to catch some memory of you. A dove was in my bosom, white as snow, when the crowbar with its pounding heartbeat hacked out a new home for you, and a deep chasm swallowed you, where to this day you sparkle under ice. Oh, I wanted to leap in beside you, but suddenly just then my dove flew up, crowning the evening sun with her white gold, and drew me upwards with her into life. Thanks, and thanks for that translation, Heather. Um, now we're going to, um, move on to one of the uh, his more famous poems and we're going to get to hear his voice um i believe i'm not sure if the audio will work but i will see avogn shikh die reder jogen jogen was bringen sie mit sich sie bringen mir avogn mit zappeln dicke schich Der Wogen wie a Huppe in oven ticken Glanz, die Schich a fulle Kuppe wie Menschen in a Tanz. A Hassene, a Jontef, sie hat mich wer verblend, die Schich a Söhne nonte, euf snei ich ob der Kent. Es klappen die Abzassen, wohin, wohin, wohin? Von alte Wilner Gassen Metreibt uns Kim Berlin. Ihr darf nicht fragen, wem es Nos tut in Harz a Riss. O sagt mir schier dem Emes, Wo sehnen sie die Fies? Die Fies von jene Tufel Mit Knäppelech wie Toi. Und do, wo ist das Guffel? Und dort, wo ist die Freu? In Kinder schich in alle, wo seh ich nit kein Kind, wo tut nit ton die Kalle, die schich alle hat sind. Durch Kinder schich und Schrabes, ich da kenn mei Mame schich, sie pflegt sie bloß auf Schabes, a räuft sie en auf sich. Uns klappen die Abzassen, wohin? Wohin, wohin, von alte Wilner Gassen betreibt uns kein Berlin. And this uh, precious recording is from an album um, put out by Folkways Records in 1960. And it's hard to follow that performance, but I will uh, try to read the English translation. This is a translation from Barbara and Benjamin Harshaw. A wagon of shoes. The wheels they drag and drag on. 
What do they bring and whose? They bring along a wagon filled with throbbing shoes. The wagon like a chuppe, in evening glow enchants. The shoes piled up and heaped up like people in a dance. A holiday, a wedding, as dazzling as a ball, the shoes familiar spreading, I recognize them all. The heels tap with no malice. Where do they pull us in? From ancient Vilna alleys, they drive us to Berlin. I must not ask you whose, my heart it skips a beat. Tell me the truth, O oh shoes, where disappeared the feet? The feet of pumps so shoddy, with button drops like dew. Where is the little body? Where is the woman too? All children's shoes, but where are all the children's feet? Why does the bride not wear her shoes so bright and neat? Mid clogs and children's sandals, my mama's shoes I see. On Sabbath, like the candles, she'd put them on in glee. The heels tap with no malice. Where do they pull us in? From ancient Vilna alleys, they drive us to Berlin. And Hadas, do you, would you like to read the Yifrit for this one? I thought uh, maybe um, I would love to say a prayer because because we, I, I, I feel that Sutzkever, when he reads it, it's understood in every language. <laughs> <laughs> well, do we want to do the start with the Yiddish for that one then? Yes, yes, okay. please. Sure. Weiß ich nicht zu wähmen. Der, was hat am Mal gehört mich, wird sie nicht vernehmen. Weiß ich nicht zu wähmen, halt sie mich in Klemmen. Öfter soll ich beten bei der Stern. Freien, mein Weiter, hab mein Wort verloren. Komm und sei ein Verbeiter. Euch der gute Stern wird es nicht der Herren. Nur hat viele Sorgen Musik. Emmets Goranonter peinigt sich in meine Schome und die viele Mond er. Will ich ohne Sinnen plapplen bis beginnen. Wilner Ghetto, 17. Januar 1942. Mitrashek la set fila. Mitrashek la set fila, ach le mi, Mi se ne chamato a itali. לא ישמע דבריה. למי? איני יודע. אחוז געגועיה. אל כוכב אפנה בצער. ידיד רחוק, נוגע. המילה שלי עבדה הרד עושה את קולותיה. אך הכוכב למעלה, גם הוא לא ישמע לה. אך אני חייב תפילה, מי בתוכי קורא לי, מתייסר בנשמתי, דורש תפילה גואלת. אקשקש בלי טעם, עד זריחת שמיים. גטו וילנה, 17 בינואר 1942. תרגמה סיוון בסקין. Um, let's move on to the last one. Again, you can see here, we're sort of trying to represent the different periods of his life. Sasha, if you want to go for this one. Boesia. A funkel violetta floim, die letzte Affenboim, din heitel die Kunzart wie a Schwarzapel, was hat bei Nacht in Toi geloschen, Liebe, Seu, Zappel, Und mit den Morgensternen ist der Teu geworden Gringe. Das ist Poesie. Rir sie ohne Säu, man soll nicht sehen, kein Simen von die Finger. 1954. 
the English poetry, a ripe dark purple plum, the last one on the tree, thin skinned and tender as the pupil of an eye, which has by night extinguished in the dew, love, vision, trembling. And with the morning star, the dew grew lighter, did not linger. That is poetry. Touch it so gently that not a trace remains there of your finger. 1954. Thank you everyone for your readings. Um, and I'm sorry if anyone didn't hear the recording, but I can edit that into the final, the recording that we'll send out to you. Well, I'd like to hand it over to you, Hadas, now to um, share whatever's uh, on your mind about, uh, about your grandfather, about his legacy, about his poetry. Um, so um, I grew up here in Israel and um, I had an only grand and only one grandfather, which was Abrashe. I called him Abrashe. So um, Abrashe was not uh, an, a normal grandfather. Okay, he, he, he wasn't grandfather who would take me to the kindergarten or uh, who would put me on his lap. He was a very respectable grandfather. He was not even called grandpa. He was called Abrashe. And this was my, my only grandfather. So the relationship with him was, uh, um, in a sense, because I, I didn't know Yiddish. I grew up in Israel, and, and, um, and my, mother, my mother was born in Israel, and she wanted to be at Sabar, and you Israeli. So she spoke Hebrew, and she spoke to me Hebrew. So I couldn't, at, at the small age, understood, understood the poetry. But the relationship uh, became very close because of the stories. I was very curious about his life and the history. So um, the, the relationship was very close. And, and from a small age, I started to interview him. And like he says um, about this poetry, that the role of a poet or an artist is to bring healing beauty in his poems in order to give you strength or to give strength to live for those who read the poetry. So also the stories. The stories that he told me about his past and about the history and about his, his, his life during the war was stories that gave you strength to live, was good ending stories. So I always um, came back to those stories and, and, and the, the, the stories influenced my life very much. Um, I always uh, say about Sutzkever that um, everybody's talking um, the, scholar, the scholars and they know a lot about the poetry and they know a lot about the history. But when I come and talk about my grandfather, I like to tell this little story that you know about not only the poet and the great, um, um, uh, the great personality and the hero and the partisan, but also about how he was as a grandfather. So um, because of the stories, I, I, I grew up with all the stories that he told me. And every time I went to Europe, I, I wanted to go to antique shops to, um, uh, to ask the, 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 the seller if they have items from the war. Because I had to make the stories a uh, reality for me. Uh, so one time I went to this antique shop in Czechoslovakia, in Prague, and this this um, a guy came to me and I asked him if he has an item from the war. And he said, yes. And he went to the attic and on his hand was a yellow star. And it was the first time I saw a yellow star. It was a, I was in shock and I was shaking and I said, what this, uh, you, you're selling this? Is, is this for sale? And he said, yes. 
it cost $200 and I didn't buy. And I went back to Israel and I went to Abrashe and I was shaking and I said, Abrashe, Abrashe. You are not going to believe this. I went to this antique shop to this guy and there was a yellow star and wanted to sell it and he wanted $200 for it. I didn't buy. And he's just sitting there very, very calmly. And with this little smile, looking at this shaking child, and he's saying, $200? That's very interesting because I got it for free. So, <laughs> so you understand that inside, um, like he wrote in a poem, you would hit that black marble, that black marble, you would hit it until a smile appears. So healing beauty in that darkest times, in those dark situations that he were, and, and, and to bring healing beauty to the tragedies, the personal tragedies that he went through, of course. So you have this uh, um, a, a poet that believed that he would survive as long as he has his poems with him, as long as he is writing. So he wrote in the ghetto every day a poem, even inside hiding in a coffin, even inside a coffin. So he would say sometimes in a poem, sometimes you're here, sometimes you're there. But inside this wooden coffin, my poem is still alive. My poetry is alive. So poetry is stronger than death. So not just in his belief, but in reality, he smuggled his poems through the Soviet partisans and they reached Moscow. And there the government uh, makes this decision to rescue a poet because of his poems. So it's not just this, this uh, uh, creation of imagination that I would survive. It gives me strength. It gives me hope. Yes. And in reality, it does happen. So Avram Sutskever was rescued from the Vilna ghetto, from the Vilna forest, um, because of his poems. So this is a real story of, of, of not just a belief, but um, the, the spiritual strength and victory. <laughs> um, uh, a poem is stronger. With my poems, even inside the ghetto walls, I am a free man. So a poem is stronger than any any bullet, than any wall. And, 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 and this is a true story. So I'm telling this to everyone. It's not a Hollywood story. It's my grandfather's story. So um, at 11 years ago, I, I had... Um, I had a proposal to do a project, a German-Israeli project. And in my family, in Sutzkeville's family, nobody goes to Germany. Until uh, um, 11 years ago, um, we didn't go to Germany, nobody from my family. But I decided to go in order to tell my grandfather's story. And I had to ask for permission, and I asked him permission to go. And I asked him, what does he think of me going to tell his story and he said yes he was 97 and I went to Germany and we worked on this show on this performance that I'm with his book and with the testimony in the Nuremberg trial and we worked on this piece for five weeks and my my grandfather Brasher was one of us on, on really like a character on stage and on the 20th of January 2010. At the evening of the premiere, I get a phone call from Israel, from my mother. And she tells me that Abrasha had died at the evening of the premiere. And I was, I was in shock and I 
said to him, it was a mistake. It was a mistake to come. I shouldn't have come. This is a mistake. And I said, listen, I, I cannot go on stage. And then somebody took me and shook me up and said, Adas, you got it all wrong. It's the opposite way. When he felt that his story is in your hand and you are lighting a candle, then he could let go. And you are lighting a candle in the most darkest place that he could think that he could be. So this is a closure. And I went on stage and I did the show and I was very, very strong and I, 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 I held myself through all the show. And then at the end of the show, the German actor said to the audience, I, thank you very much. I want to say something that we worked on this piece for five weeks and Avon Sutzkevel was one of us, but today he had died. And all the German audience just stood and started to applaud. And that was the moment that I started to cry. And I said, this is a closure that the German audience standing and applauding to Avon Sutzkevel. So that was the turning point for me to start to produce, produce the film that I hope you saw or I hope you will see um, further on. Oh, thank you so much, um, Hadass. It's, I've heard some of these stories and even the ones I've heard before, um, uh, just so wonderful to have your personal perspective. Well, um, I'd love to open it up now for some discussion. Um, so people feel free to put questions that you have in the Q&A. Um, uh, as Justin mentioned at the top, we have a lot of distinguished um, colleagues in the audience and I wish we could bring you all <laughs> in to present, but I think we're limited by this platform to just receive your, your questions. Um, well, I, I'll get us started with maybe a question to really anyone in the group, maybe Justin, your perspective would be interesting as it would be Hadas. What is your, your take on sort of why now? I mean, in the last few years, there have been multiple new translations of of Sutzkever's work into various languages. We have these new documentary films. I mean, do you, is this just due to all of our collective work or, you know, what is happening now in, is it a historical moment that people are turning to him um, since his, his death? Um, what do you think? Adas, do you wanna start or? <laughs> oh, well, I, I, I'll just say that, that um, after he had died in the newspaper, it's, it's a continuation of the story, but in the newspaper in Germany, okay, there was on the front, uh, Avram Sutzkever, the great dichter, right, the great poet had died on the, the headlines, Avram Sutzkever had died. And I came to Israel and the Lithuanian government stood for two minutes in honor of the poets. And uh, the French foreign affairs sent condolences to the Israeli government, who was so embarrassed not to know who had died. So people who doesn't know the, the uh, um, uh, the relationship between Yiddish and Hebrew in Israel don't know that the Yiddish was put aside in Israel. It wasn't a, another language like, like it's in another country, but it's, it's, it was the language from there, from 
It was, it was, um, it was the sister, but the sister that was put aside and, uh, and didn't get the place that she should have because there was one language and it was Hebrew. So, um, there was the turning point of everything, I think. And many people uh, understood it, that we had to make a change. We had to bring uh, Avram Sutzkever back uh, um, uh, to the awareness as a great poet that he is, as a great personality, as, the, uh, um, as a, a, a person who was, who was responsible of, of, of saving the cultural um, uh, cultural treasures from Vilnius, as 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 so many things. And if you would read uh, Justin's uh, translation, new translation, you would understand uh, the impact of of Avram Sutskever uh, in those in those years, and of course in his poetry. So the change had to be made, and everybody I think who knew Sutskever made his, you know, made his impact. Like Justin, like Benny Mer here in Israel, like Noverstein, from Noverstein, like what we did in the films, in the two films that we, uh, uh, we, we created the, the, um, uh, the verbal diamond and Black Honey. So people understood that he must get his place again. Um, um, and we, we should do the step. I mean, I think that um, in addition to what um, Hadass has said, there might be a couple of other structural reasons. Uh, one, unfortunately, it's human nature not to um, appreciate things while, while they're still around. So I think uh, it's not unusual uh, when a writer dies to, after a period of time, see a renewed interest in their work. Part of it has to do with um, sort of the difficulty of writing about a writer while they're still alive and in control of their own sort of um, creative output. Uh, the other, th the other uh, major thing I think has to do with um, the incredible investment in translation uh, that's gone on not only by the book center, but uh, we had just have, it's not only that Sutskover is being translated more, we have uh, an incredible number of uh, new women prose writers who are being translated uh, who 10 years ago uh, might not have been. So we're in a moment of translation. Uh, we're in a moment of receptivity. We're in a moment of institutions supporting translation. Uh, and I think we're also in a transitional generational moment. Uh, I have incredible respect for those who did the groundbreaking work on Sutskover uh, before me. I'm talking about the Weisses and the Roskies, the Noversterns, the Harshavs, right? Uh, and many others. Uh, but once uh, a generation shifts, then you have new perspectives, new texts that take on importance, new desires to provide um, a different voice. And I think we're seeing that uh, in Sutskever and also uh, in Yiddish literature more broadly. Well, we have a specific uh, historical question here. What was Sutskever's relationship with Ava Kovna? Hadass, do you want to talk? Justin, Justin, not no. me. <laughs> I was just invited early, a few hours ago. Um, so uh, Abba Kovner was the deputy commander of the uh, partisan organization in the ghetto. Sutskover was a member of that organization. Um, and when Itzik Wittenberg, the communist uh, commander of that, was uh, basically uh, demanded uh, be turned over to the Gestapo, uh, Kovner uh, came into control of that. Of course, Kovner um, followed Sutskever's career. He knew Yiddish fluently, uh, even though um, his uh, we have exchanges of letters between Kovner and Sutskever in uh, the Sutskever archives in Jerusalem. Uh, and they stayed in touch all through their careers. But I think that uh, Kovner's reputation, uh, Kovner's Zionism, Kovner's testimony at the Eichmann trial, uh, Kovner sort of, because he was a Hebrew poet, in Israel took on a completely different direction than perhaps what um, Sutskever did. So their relationship was personal, but aesthetically they went in different directions. I can tell you that when I tried, to, when I first suggested translating the Sutskever ghetto memoir and presented an initial talk at Yad Vashem, a very eminent uh, Israeli scholar uh, 
was quite angry that I was taking this on. And in fact, I, I think a little insulting and said, um, why, why do you Yiddishists always need to have your own hero? It's clear that Kovner was the hero of the ghetto. And, you know, what do you, what, what do you need this for? So, I mean, I think that historically these relationships can be competitive and vexed, but on a personal level, each of them knew what the other had gone through and that remained. I don't know if I could um, ask you, I, I really love that quote that Krista just asked her to, to put in the chat uh, for me because I didn't remember it word by word and it's very powerful. The more realistic a poet is, the further he is from reality. The more fantastical a poet is, the closer he is to reality. Um, could you elaborate on that quote? It's one of my favorites of discovers, you know, Yerusha. Krista, is that you? Yes, no, it's I, Krista. <laughs> yes, it's Krista. It's Krista, I think it's you. You're the one who quoted it. Uh, well, I mean, maybe <laughs> we can talk about, it's interesting, you know, um, for Emily and I, who and Hadass, who've been in many of these events as well, um, that this is the line in the film, one of the lines in the film that really people, that sticks with people. Um, and I love it. I know Emily, loves it too. Um, and maybe, Emily, you can add if you have a perspective. For me, I think this really gets, this echoes what I, what Ruth Weiss's um, analysis really introduced for me about Sitzkever, the idea that, um, that, that poetry was a major part of his religion, his spirituality, the sense that poetry could and can um, allow one to transcend the physical situation that one is in. Um, I know I've experienced that personally as a reader of poetry. Um, and, uh, and, and the second part of the quote I think is even more um, interesting in a way that is, is that distance from reality actually getting closer to the kernel of truth about reality? And can, what is, I think it's a quotation about what poetry offers us. Um, so I don't know if anyone else has something to say about that. I, I, want, to, I want to add that um, to free oneself from um, personality, and freeing oneself with the from from the emotion of of uh, it's 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 uh, an example of a poet that he wrote after his mother's death. She was murdered in Ponar, um, and he writes a poem, and in that poem she is talking to him. And she's saying to him, child, don't be in grief. It's a sin. Because if you are here, then I am here also. As the same way as the core of the plum contains within itself the tree and the nest and the bird and everything around. So it means that poetry frees you from your personality and gives you uh, strength to see uh, uh, the point of view of spirituality, which is God, which is, that's how I see it. But to do that, only a personality of a poet can do it. So to, to, to uh, reach out a level of not not being in grief and that the po the, the poetry would would free you from from the feelings the pain is a personality can do a personality of a poet i think i'm i'm helping <laughs> <laughs> Emily, Justin, Diana, Sasha, do you, anyone want to add anything about that? Uh, no, but Sasha uh, said, and I see some questions in the Q&A category. Yeah. There's, there's another question here. 
Can someone say something about his role in preserving the memory and legacy of his friends and colleagues who did not survive the war? Justin, Justin. the Golden and Kate? Sure, I, uh, I mean, uh, in almost everything he did, he preserved the memory of his friends and his family uh, and his colleagues who didn't survive the war. We can go from the macro to the way uh, Vilna and Yiddish continues to be a major source of inspiration in his poetry, even after uh, he becomes a resident of Tel Aviv. But I think even on a small level, uh, he republishes the works of poets who don't come out in his journal, De Golden Cape, that he founds in 1949. He attends uh, and writes about uh, young friends of his from Jung Vilna. Uh, in that uh, collection, he comes to events where their poetry is written about. I mean, the mem, the mem we, we, we've talked a lot today about the poet Sutskever. I and uh, um, the recent translation of Sutskever's fiction talk about him as a prose writer. I think there's a lot to be said also about Sutskever, the memoirist, right? Uh, especially the post-war memoirist and what he does in De Golden Kate in creating uh, really a, not only a memoiristic literature, but a new literature that will carry on the traditions of those um, that who, who had trained him and those we had worked with. So he's incredibly important in preserving the memory of, for instance, the, the poets of Jung Vilna, the artists, the writers and republishing things and telling stories about him to see him. There's an old video of Sutskever speaking at the YIVO, the old building of YIVO in New York, where uh, someone asks him a similar question and his mood immediately changes and he starts describing the antics of his friend, the poet Laser Wolf. And he's quoting Wolf off by heart without any notes. Uh, and you can see the, uh, the return to youthfulness and sort of the respect he has for that moment. And he does the same thing for Soviet writers. The so not only the Soviet writers who he met when he was in Moscow for two years, but then he becomes one of the co-editors of a major collection published in Israel in the 1960s of Soviet Yiddish writers. So we have, you know, multiple examples of him uh, preserving those memories. Great. Well, we're, we're almost out of time here. Um, so I just want to thank everyone for coming. And um, I want, I, if you're in the San Diego area, you have a few more hours to watch Bervet Blyden through the San Diego International Jewish Film Festival. Um, if you're not in the San Diego area, keep your eye on the Yiddish Book Center's website for a screening coming to a city near you soon. Um, and I, I want to just invite everyone to really, uh, it's so wonderful that Heather's book is, is um, available for free now. Um, and there are these wonderful new translations. If you're into memoir, if you're into prose, if you're into poetry, there's really um, it's accessible in the original and um, more and more in, uh, in other languages as well. So thank you all so much for coming and Leyen's Gesundheit Heit, um, read well and um, stay well. And just before you go off, Krista and Emily and Hadas, it's really a wonderful movie and testament uh, that you've produced. I know that Hadas mentioned earlier uh, the film Black Honey that, that is an Israeli film about Sutskever that precedes this. But to watch both of those things together uh, is really an amazing accomplishment. And now we just need to work on the feature film, uh, the Hollywood film, and uh, to bring them to, 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 the, to the big screen. So thank you for your play and the musical and all of the every genre. <laughs> <laughs> the yes, musical, Hollywood Let's go for the musical, I'm not so sure of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you, you'd be surprised. <laughs> imagine, imagination. Well, take care, everyone. Um, Blythe's Gesundheit. Yes, and if, uh, before everybody goes away, I would like to invite um, local San Diegans and La Hoyans to visit our in-person location. We opened in November, Yiddishland, California. Sasha is putting the link in the chat and also I put it in the chat, but I would like to talk about it. Uh, I know in San Diego we have a lot of Yiddish poetry fans, so if they would like to organize more events like this one, please write to us and we will definitely do so.
with your help. We have amazing guests today. Thank you so much. Great to see you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Shalom from Tel Aviv. Thank you.